Thanks for tuning in to the HR Chat Podcast. Hey, this is Bill Bannum, one of the hosts of the show. Just before we get into today's episode, here's a quick message from one of our supporting partners. We get people. We know what they want from work, why they join, why they leave, why they stay. We get tech, and we understand that it's never the whole solution. At Talent Solutions RPO, we work across every industry and talent market in the world. In the end, it's people who make the difference. Let Talent Solutions RPO help you get the people your organization needs. Visit mpgtalentsolutions.com slash HR chat to learn more. Welcome to the HR Chat Podcast, bringing the best of the HR and talent communities to you. Welcome to another episode of the HR Chat Show. I'm your host today, Bill Bannum. And in this episode, I am delighted to say that we're welcoming back William Tinkup. And we're going to talk all things to do with recruitment and technology. William is the president at Recruiting Daily and a member of multiple boards of advisors at the intersection of HR and tech. William is a writer, speaker, advisor, consultant, investor, storyteller, and teacher. He's written hundreds of HR articles, spoken at over 150 HR and recruiting conferences, and conducted over 1,000 HR podcasts. This podcast episode is sponsored by Virgin Pulse, the number one global employee well-being solution provider supporting seven and a half million members in 20 languages across 190 countries. Virgin Pulse offers solutions that deliver on their home base for health vision of simplifying and unifying other point products into a better together ecosystem and transform the mental, physical, financial, social, community, and emotional health of organizations and their people. You can learn more at virginpulse.com. William, it's my pleasure to welcome you back to the show, sir. I'm happy to be here, Bill. Thank you for having me on. And I should just add as well, listeners, that um, William, uh, I've, I saw him present uh, one session once where he used one slide throughout the whole session and it stuck with me and it's still one of the best presentations I ever saw. Um, <laughs> William, what, what, what's going on? It's been a while since we since we spoke. It it has, um, you know. I think I think you know. Obviously, we we're in the midst of COVID, and God only knows how long it it lasts. I do see uh, a a bit of the ice, uh, you know, uh, cracking a little bit, and people looking at technology. They're looking to hire. In fact, uh, I had a, a gal tweet to me yesterday. She's got eighty open recs and two recruiters. So completely overwhelmed with. Now that they've reduced staff and uh, reduced their hiring uh, team and all that stuff, and now she's got it to hire, ramp back up, and you know, and she's got literally another recruiter with her, so she's got forty recs a person. So, you know, that's a it's a good thing on one level. Like, okay, hiring's happening again, and hiring has been happening throughout this process. Um, but uh, but oh, okay, now now what do we do? How do we kind of get back into the business of you know, hiring sourcers and recruiters and how do we, you know, bring that talent back on board. I th- I, I'm i starting to see a, a bit of that, you know, cracking and, and, and that's a good thing. And uh, I'm, I'm happy that I'm seeing some of the technology purchases and implementation. So it's not, it's not the breakneck pace that we were, you know, uh, accustomed to in December, in January, early January. Uh, but at the same time, it is happening. Uh, hiring never stopped, uh, especially for some industries, hiring just ramped really, really far up. But for a lot of folks, obviously, with you know, in America, as many people that went into an unemployment uh, and, put, and the number of people that are unemployed, unemployed right now, it's, it's, these are our numbers. Um, but but I, I think we are starting to see some of that starting to uh, to kind of come back a little bit, which I'm excited about. Yeah, hopefully there's um, there's a big 
rebound and we're going to talk a bit about that later on william but um i i wanted to pick your brains you you recently hosted uh the hrtx virtual summit back in in early september uh, 9th and 10th i think it was uh you hand selected 18 of the highest rated trainers that you've worked with over the last 12 months like uh, the awesome carmen hudson and katrina collier who uh the audience over in the uk will be aware of and and you built a virtual sourcing event around them uh, the event attracted over 3,000 attendees. Tell our listeners all about it. Yeah, it was. it's a really interesting concept because what we wanted to do is not just do topical training. Um, so our events are, are training and not conferences, and the difference being uh, real tactical, things you can use tomorrow, whereas conferences, as you well know, some of it's intellectual, it's academic, it's trying to get you to think, um, et cetera. These are, these are really tactical things. But what we wanted to do and what we achieved in September was um, you bring a wreck. So the audience gets to bring a wreck that they have open, and the sourcers then take that wreck and s- show people how they would source for that wreck. So it's real specific, you know, when people would show up with, I'm looking for a software engineer in Topeka, Kansas, with three years of, you know, defense department uh, experience. Okay, so then, you know, Carmen or Jer, they would, or Katrina, they would then take that wreck and right in front of people, show them how they would then go and try and find candidates for that job. And so it was a lot, it's, you know, live (laughs) in front of people. And not training based on a topic like we're, we're, we've done a lot of training, you know, how to, how to source from Facebook, how to source from TikTok, how to source from Instagram, you know, those types of topical sourcing training. Those are great. And they, those will continue to be great. This event we wanted to, over two days, we wanted to do something completely different where we said, okay, audience, you bring, you know, your hardest challenges to this group of people, these 18, you know, expert trainers, and then let them show you what they would do with that in real time right in front of you. And it was magical. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd, I'd like to get back to talking a little bit about the the, the, the jobs market with you now. Um, we'll, we'll try and make this a positive interview today, William. Um, mm-hmm. But we, 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 should, we should talk about, you know, the way things look right now and, and how a lot of people can get out of, a sticky situation and how recruiters and, and managers can can find can find the best talents um paint a bit more of a picture for me in, in terms of what's happened since february march to, to the job market and yeah. and and how is it rebounding now so we're, we're we're recording this interview in you know towards the the the, the latter part of uh of, of, of 2020 um, people are hoping that by by the holidays at the latest they're they're, they're back in work, and uh, employers are hoping that they've got all their processes in place for their future proofed against a potential second wave. T- just talk to your audience for, for a minute or two, if you don't mind, about sure. what, about what the heck's happened, but but also what they can expect to see. Well, I I think you know from my perspective, I think one of the things that you get is. Um, you, you you get from a knowledge worker perspective is you've got an opening now that we've proven to ourselves that for the last, you know, X number of months, we can do a job if it's outcome based, we can do a job from anywhere in the world. And that what that's what that's the the, the miracle that just happened that we're probably still not consumed yet is that now you can apply to jobs anywhere in the world. And employers can hire from anywhere in the world. Whereas before we would have looked at jobs, if, you know, if we were in Toronto, we would look for jobs in Toronto uh, because we would occasionally go into the office or occasionally meet for the team and things like that. But over these last, with COVID, uh, we've learned that, you know, you can substitute that with Uber conference or Zoom or other Slack, other types of communication and collaboration tools where you can work anywhere in the world. And that's changed employment. I I believe that concept has changed employment forever. Now we can literally work, knowledge workers can work from anywhere in the world. So the aperture of hiring 
and for candidates from both sides. So now hiring managers and recruiters and sourcers can look at a much wider aperture and candidates can look at a wider, much wider aperture, which will help hiring because now people, instead of thinking that they have to hire within a certain geography or zip code or postal code, now they don't have to and candidates will do the same. So the good news is we would have eventually gotten to this place. COVID sped all of that up for us. Um, so, so on, it's, it's, you know, a lot of people were sick. A lot of people, um, you know, passed away, a lot of hardships with recessions. And so, okay, all of that being said, and, uh, not to dis, you know, not to, not to diminish any of the, the, those things, we've gotten to a much better place employment wise, because now we're not tethered to location. So, the upside for everyone listening is that, you know, your your prospects, your future prospects for jobs now just got much brighter and much wider uh, than, than they were, let's say, December of 19. So I think there's a tremendous positivity to that that we haven't, you know, quite unearthed yet because uh, of all the things that, that, that are going on in 2020 and have gone on in 2020. Um, I think, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, with, with, with that is that companies went through, um, you know, they kind of reacted, maybe even overreacted at the beginning of COVID and cut deep. And the idea was instead of doing a thousand tiny cuts, make one drastic cut and hope you don't have to cut again. Um, and, you know, time will tell on whether or not that was a great strategy or not, but, Hiring when you when we hire those folks back in, I don't think that they're going to come back to the office in the way that that the, that we did in December of nineteen. So the office itself, again, kind of in parallel with what I said before, the office itself is going to be an interesting thing. We where we thought the office was culture, and what we've learned is that culture isn't the office per se. Culture is, is the communication, collaboration, uh, and interactions with, you know, all of our team and all of the, of the human beings. So, you know, I think what's going to be interesting is it's, it's office is going to, working at the office is going to be optional, and which is going to, again, again, be a great freedom for candidates and employees to then be able to work where they want to work and how they want to work. So if they want to go to the office, let's say you've got two kids under five and they've got a nanny, they want to go to the office so that they can kind of go and be away from that. Great. Or they're extroverts you know, they want to go to work. But if, again, if they don't want to, they don't have to. So again, I, I think it's, I think it's when, as we can see these waves of hires that come back in, whether or not it's sourcing and, uh, and re recruiting or marketing, whatever those, whatever those positions that get come back in first, I think it's going to be optional. Like I remember reading a study in Indeed put out in 2017 where one of the keywords, key phrases that were searched was remote work. And this was three years ago. And this was one of the top five phrases that was on that, was, that people were looking for. Well, that that's going to be the number one phrase that people look for post twenty twenty. Is it you know whatever the job is, can I work remotely? Period. If I can't, I'm not going to apply. So it's going to change the way we think about work again from a you know from a from a perspective of uh of do i need to be at that office or do i just need to be able to do the job let's let, let's talk a bit more about those people who will be um entering the the, the workforce um and, and let's maybe break it down in, into two groups william um, those those with prior experience and perhaps those who were uh, just about ready to to enter the workforce for the first time or following an internship. Um, so the, 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 the Gen Zs. Um, in terms of those people who would be re-entering the workforce, what, what's changed for them? What, what, what skills perhaps have been taken away and are now going to be um, replaced by uh, machines, by AI, uh, have been aug augmented in some way? What does that mean for that group in terms of needing to um, upskill before re-entering a position, and 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 throwing in the um, the, the uh, Gen Z as well, 
what does it mean for for the, uh, the Gen Zers who are entering the, the workplace? Actually, is, is this going to be a huge competitive advantage to them because they would never have known anything else? Okay, so um, they'll, they'll be going in um, expecting to uh, be a bit more agile in, in the way they work uh, in in terms of working in, in an augmented environment, um, uh, being prepared to maybe take um, take take a role which is perhaps more um, uh, un uncertain. It might not be a direct employee role. They might they might be jumping in from the gig economy uh, standpoint. Talk to us about the, those, those two different groups with very different expectations. Now. So Gen Z, being digital natives, to your point, are not threatened by technology. So I think your your intuition is is spot on. Um, they're, they've they've grown up with Siri. They've grown up with the internet. They can ask Google anything they want to. They're just not things that are automated. Things that are uh, ubiquitous uh, are natural to them, and so they're not going to see them as a threat. Okay, so the so the upside for Gen Z is technology and enablement and automation and all of those things. None of that is a threat to them. They don't even see that as a threat. It's not even on their radar. The the downside for Gen Z is is simple. With a recession, you have compaction. You have people that used to have, let's say, a director role are now doing a manager role or managers that are now doing a coordinator role. And so just getting into the workforce is going to be the hardest part uh, because you have overqualified people above you that have come down to take the positions below you, which used to be your entry spot. Uh, so that's going to be the hardest part is just getting a job. But the job itself, not intimidating. And again, anything technology related, uh, related is not going to be something that they, you know, that, that overwhelms them. So for them, there's a plus minus, not intimidated by technology, harder to get the job because of the people above them already have five, six, 10 years of experience. Um, with those folks that were let go or um, that stayed on, they stayed on and it took lower roles uh, just to stay on and keep benefits, et cetera. Um, the, the folks, the, their, their biggest challenge, let's just say that's you know other generations other than Gen Z, uh, their biggest challenge is, again, do, where do they thrive? Do they thrive in the office and in, in that collaboration that happens there? Or have they thrived in a world of Zoom uh, where it's outcomes based? And so the, the thing for them is when work changes, if you will, let's say we're past COVID or post COVID, where are they gonna thrive is making sure that they understand I thrive best in this environment, whatever that is in the office, partially in the office, at home, <laughs> we're working from the other side of the planet, whatever, where do I thrive? And then the second question that you asked was uh, technology uh, and, and you know, where do they see uh, technology as a, a friend or foe? I think that, um, most of the folks will look at technology, especially AI, machine learning, et cetera, anything that automates the job, I think they look at that and they see it for what it is. It's not a threat. It does things that they probably shouldn't have been doing and didn't want to do, like scheduling. Like, you know, if you schedule something ever again, that's that's a problem. That means that, you know, you, 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 you probably need to be retrained to do something different because there's technology that can do that for you. So they're going to see it as they should as like, okay, these are tools that will help me do the job that I can then go and spend time doing other parts of the job that, that technology is not enabling. So strategy, you know, things like that. Like I look at HR and I say to myself, you know, HR is fighting fires every day. And if you can give them some of their time back with some of this technology enablement and automation, well, then now they can be, they have their time back. They have some of their time back. They can go be strategic and they want to be strategic. So I think, I think, you know, there's a plus minus on both sides. I'd, I'd love to hear from you now, William. What, what do you think is, is, has changed as a result of coronavirus in terms of innovation within 
recruitment, whether, whether that's um, uh, fast tracking certain types of recruitment technology. You, you mentioned using uh, new sources such as TikTok earlier on. Um, please, in your answer, go beyond the the, the art of embracing video interviews for, for recruiters. Uh, <laughs> what, what, what are some of the, yeah, be, be, beyond the video, uh, what, what are some of the big changes we've seen in the last six months? I think people are looking at the the micro experiences, like every type of experience that a candidate can have and how can they make that better? And also how can they make it more candidate centric? So a candidate, like, what do you want? What do you, what questions would you like to ask? How do you want to interact with the team, et cetera? Um, so I think that, that people have dug deep, even in an employer driven market, I've seen a lot of articles, I've seen a lot of conversations or heard a lot of conversations and I've, I've just seen a lot of technologies that are now trying to leverage the candidate experience and make it more personal to them. So that what do you, what do you, what would you like to get out of this experience? Because we're trying to get to fit. And I think that's ultimately what we've seen the growth in, uh, in, in recruiting technologies, getting to fit faster. So how do we get to fit candidate employer? How do we get to fit faster? Um, and so this, this is kind of, how do you attract an and repel simultaneously? How do you get to a point where you, you the candidate, can say, no, that's not a job for me. That's, that doesn't fit me. Or the employer says, no, this, is, this isn't a good can't. That's not a good fit. So how do we get to that faster and both have a great experience? We want our hiring managers to have a great experience. We want our recruiters to have a great experience. We want our sourcers to have a great experience. We want our candidates to have a great experience. We want any executives to interact in hiring. We want them to have a great experience. So it's everyone should be able to get out of this what they want and and at the same time, um, everyone have a great experience. I'd like to talk a little bit about em, em, employer branding. In terms of projecting an attractive employer brand, what what's been the challenge for organisations during during the pandemic? And do you think that the the bar has been lowered or raised in in, in terms of how companies need to show themselves towards potential? Uh, candidates towards potential hires and what I mean by that is um, you know it, it, like you said earlier on that um, <laughs> uh, it's an employer's market right now um, so maybe they don't need to try so hard or actually maybe it's it, it's the reverse in, in a in, in a crisis like this you've got to set yourself apart as, as a as an employer of choice for when when the market does rebound this is the perfect time to act like it is a candidate driven market so what I mean by that is um, this is not the the time nor the place to regress into old habits where we treat the candidate poorly. Um, and the reason, main reason for that is it isn't going to be that long that this is this way, A, and B, that we live in a much more transparent world than we did than, than the last time uh, that we had a recession. So the last time we went through, you know, the Great Recession here in the United States, um, you know, it was less, the social was there, but it wasn't as ubiquitous as it is today. So one of the things I would tell people is you need to act like you're in a hyper transparent world. Yes, there are more people applying to the job uh, than there was in December. Fantastic. Treat them treat them carefully, be nice to them and in all ways, shapes and forms that you can. So that, you know, again, just because there's more people that apply, you're going to want to, you're going to want to have great relationships with those folks. And again, maybe not for that job, that moment, but you're going to want to build those relationships for the moments in which you need to go and hire a thousand engineers, you know, in, in one quarter, you're going to have great relationships with people. And that's predicated on how you treat them now. If you treat people well now, when you don't have to, then they're going to remember you and you're, they're going to have a positive brand experience. And so I, my advice to employer brand and recruiters um, right now is just act like it's still December of 19 and don't let your mind, even though you're having more people apply to the job, don't let your mind slip into bad behaviors. We are coming towards the end of this interview, William, um, before we wrap things up, tell us a bit more about uh, recruiting daily. What, what, what's happening over there at the moment? Have you got any more events coming up? Uh, you've got some pretty amazing podcasts, which are getting launched all the time. Uh, tell our listeners a bit more about all the wonderful yeah. things that they can check out over there. 
Yeah, the the podcasts are great. Uh, I do a lot of topical podcasts, uh, which are just fun, taking on specific topics and kind of tearing them down. Um, doing a podcast called the Use Case Podcast, which is really I'm trying to get at the heart of how people buy technology. So, like, what is the process? You know, when when the vendor's not there, what happens? Um, so that's kind of a fun bit. Um, we have two events, uh, one in November, one in December, uh, again, training events, uh, sourcing training events in particular, and, uh, always looking for great content. So if anybody would like to write about, you know, opinions, uh, or, or things that they have going on, I always like, I always like people that challenge kind of the status quo. <laughs> like, I don't understand why we do it this way like who decided that uh so I, lo I love those types of articles but things are things are going well it's a it's a good time to be in talent acquisition to be studying talent acquisition because there's going as you have you already you know alluded, alluded to there's so much change there's technology change there's process change there's collaboration change and just a massive you know, employer driven market candidate driven market you got scarcity and surplus. You got all kinds of fun stuff going on. It's just a, a really good time to be in talent acquisition. And William, how can our listeners connect with you? Are you on LinkedIn? Do you, do you tweet a bit? You're all over TikTok by the sounds of it. Uh, what okay. are the best ways to, to get in touch? Um, I'm, you know, I, find, I make it very easy for to get in touch with me. So just tin cup at recruitingdaily.com. But if you just put my name into Google, um, you'll you'll be able to find me all the way to my cell number so it's it's actually really 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 super easy to find me and i'd love to talk with you know anyone on the vendor side or practitioner side william um i've had the pleasure of interviewing i don't know well over 200 guests so far on this show and um i, I just want to i just want to say to you today before we wrap things up i've got so much respect for you um your voice is so powerful within the industry. And um, I just want you to keep doing what you're doing. And listeners, if you haven't checked out William and all the wonderful things that they're, they're doing over at Recruiting Daily in the past, where have you been? Get over there. They, they are just <laughs> so fantastic. Well, thank you so much, my friend. I appreciate you and I appreciate your audience. And listeners, that just leaves me to say for today, a big thanks to William and thank you to, to you, the audience as well, for listening. And until next time, happy working. Thank you for listening to the HR Chat Podcast, brought to you by the HR Gazette.